Good morning everybody and welcome to this fourth Sunday in Advent. It's amazing to think that it's just a few days, not even a week, until Christmas Day. But let me pause and remind you of the service times that we're having at the church. Firstly, on a Thursday evening at half past five, we are having a Christingle service, which is a service um, that involves children and people of every age but we make a symbol of an orange, which is called a Christingle, and then the service unpacks the symbolism, half past five on Thursday. And then on Christmas Day, Friday the 25th, there will be two services, one at eight o'clock and the other at 10 o'clock. And then from then on, the two Sundays following, both the 27th of December and the 3rd of January, only one service at United at nine o'clock. Listen to Irina now as she reads from the scriptures for us. Luke 1, 26 till 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. In one of his Christmas sermons, Frederick Beekner quotes St. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. For we preach Christ, crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Beekner continues in his piece. He may as well have written, We preach Christ born or Christmas, because his birth presents no fewer problems than the death does to both religious people, the Jews, or to everybody else, the Gentiles. If you do not, con if you do not hear the message of Christmas, something that must strike some as blasphemy and others as sheer fantasy, the chances are that you have not heard the message for what it is. Blasphemy? Fantasy? That's not the Christmas we know. Of all we know about our God from the Old Testament, we can be reasonably sure that God is mighty and powerful. Some say God lives in unapproachable light. And I guess there are other world religions who speak about their gods in a similar way. Human beings experience God as mystery, as other, that is, as a God we can know only through faith. But this is not the end of the story. 
Transcendent as God is, God nevertheless makes God's self known to the world, doesn't he? How? In nature, we see God's love in the beauty we can see and experience all around us. We see God's love in the kindness of the people we know and love. We can also see God's wrath in the harsh and powerful forces of nature. History reveals the nature of God's dealings with Israel. God's kindness to us testifies to who God is. God makes God's self known to humanity through people. Well, the prophets of old, for example, who spoke God's mighty word to God's people. The martyrs who fearlessly maintained their devotion to God, even in the face of danger and death. The mystics who called us to prayer and the Christian writers who have stretched our minds over the generations. All these people have been used by God to reveal God's self to us. But at Christmas time, we think about things a little differently. The writer to the Hebrews reminds us that although God had all those options for self-revelation available, at Christmas God used a different method altogether. In the past, this is from Hebrews 1, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. God who is mystery, light, the God who refused to be named, who refused that Moses should see his face and live, this God has revealed himself to us in Jesus. He has become God with us, Emmanuel. I often find myself wondering at God's tactics. To tell you the truth, I'm quite flummoxed at the way God chooses to do things. And here again, at the crossroads of grace and faith, I find myself wondering why God does things the way he does. Theologians and Christian thinkers have wondered long about exactly how we are saved. Considering the scriptures and even the long tradition of God with Israel, two concepts emerge. On the one hand, there is grace. It is well accepted that our salvation, certainly for Protestants, our salvation is a gift of God. We did nothing to deserve it, nothing to earn it. God gave his grace to us because he loves us. And then on the other hand, there is faith. Jesus looks for it in people. He heals those who have it. He points to it as having accomplished what people regard as the miraculous. And he praises people for having it. So what, save, what saves us? Is it grace or is it faith? And which comes first? Does God give me his gracious gift of salvation and then my faith accepts it or the other way around? The interplay appears again in the story of this young woman, Mary. God sends an angel to her to announce his grace. Mary, you're going to have a child and he is going to be Emmanuel, God with us. The angel waits to hear a word of faith for light to come, for the one you love to come, for the word of life to be spoken, we must wait in faith. And so Mary responds in faith, discovering a deep braveness, a courage that she never knew she had. But it wasn't easy. As Beekner puts it, there is doubt hard on the heels of every belief, Fear hard on the heels of every hope, and holy things lie in ruins because the world has ruined them and we have ruined them. And yet faith waits. Mary becomes a symbol of faith, grace and truth. Grace on the one hand, the gift of God. Faith on the other hand, the response of humankind. Which comes first? 
Well, to tell you the truth, it doesn't really matter. They are partners, grace and faith. Sometimes grace is irresistible and we embrace it when it comes to us. And sometimes the angel bearing grace must wait, like he did with Mary, for the word of faith to be spoken in return. And then she says the unexpected thing. This young girl, barely a woman, of whom much will be expected. This Mary, whose name means bitterness. A prophecy of the great heartache she is about to experience. Throughout her life and until she stands at the foot of a criminal's cross. She says yes. And I suppose somewhere in a distant place where human eye has never seen or been allowed to peer in, somewhere among angel choirs, there came a sigh of huge relief. The salvation of the entire world hung on that response of faith. And then there was hope for all of us, a small sign of faithfulness amid a dark and faithless world. Mary says, yes, let it be unto me just as you have said. And the yes of a young girl brought the wide river of God's grace flooding into human history. Then the God who had kept his face from all of us and who declared that he would die, we would die simply by looking at him, revealed himself completely in the person of Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it a miracle? It was just as the prophet said, Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. You will conceive and give birth to a son, says the angel, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Luke 1 verses 31 to 33. It's hard for us to understand what Paul is referring to some 2000 years after the events of the first Christmas. How is it good news? How is it that the good news of Jesus is a stumbling block to the Jews? How is it that the good news of Jesus is folly to the Gentiles? And yet maybe the Christmas industry, the tons of cards and truckloads of presents, the roast dinners and jovial little Christmas songs, maybe all of this is simply a longing for the Christmas story to be true. Maybe somewhere deep within us is a desperate need to know Emmanuel, a long forgotten passion to discover God with us, a deep hunger to see his face. And so we search blindly among the Christmas, the Christmas gift wrap and the reindeer dolls for a glimpse of him who came out that cold Middle Eastern night. So what does all of this mean? Here we are with less than a week to go. Well, my friends, God has come to us as a gift of grace and by a brave human act of faith. God has come to us. We've been set free. Our sins are forgiven. God has changed our destiny. We who were objects of wrath have become objects of mercy. We who were once hopeless, without hope, have been given great hope. Emmanuel, God with us. God has shown us his face. And so the Christmas story is exactly as the angels announced. Glad tidings of great joy for all the people. The joy is for all the people because what has divided us from each other has been destroyed. God and humankind are at peace. And this is the age of hope. We can look forward to Christ's return. 
Maybe you and I can venture a little faith this Christmas. Maybe we can say with the church through the ages, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen.